Hello again, geography. Uh, so with this video, we're going to finish going over the early river civilizations. The video, the video you had yesterday went over uh, Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt. So this one will finish up by going over the Indus civilization and ancient China. Um, so uh, to start with and get in, just to start getting into the Indus civilization, um, right off the bat, it's kind of interesting how um, comparatively little we know about the Indus civilization than about the other three. There is a pretty severe shortage of information about the Indus civilization, stemming primarily from the fact that um, historians and anthropologists have yet to uh, decipher their language, um, or I guess more accurately, their system of writing. Um, so that really is kind of inhibiting our knowledge of uh, much of their society. But we still know uh, some general characteristics. Uh, so looking at the physical geography of the Indus civilization, it's concentrated primarily between the Indus and the Ganges River, or the, the Indus and the Ganges Rivers, in present-day Pakistan and India. And right off the bat, kind of in a similar way to... Um, Mesopotamia and Egypt, uh, the Indus and the Ganges rivers are prone to flooding, which again, in this case, is a double-edged sword. Uh, the floods do deposit rich, fertile silt on the riverbanks, which make um, which makes really good farmland. But um, the Indus, at least, was prone to unpredictable flooding that could actually be destructive in nature. Um, the other really unique aspect about the geography or climate of the Indus civilization was the monsoon cycle. Uh, so the Indus civilization is located on the, or was located on the Indian subcontinent. And um, that region of the world is, its climate is heavily influenced by uh, monsoon cycles to the point where they don't necessarily have four seasons like uh, the U.S. does in, the, in its temperate climate zone. Instead, there's a rainy season and there's a dry season. And this monsoon cycle gave the uh, climate in the region um, an air of unpredictability. The successful, successfully farming in this region depends on the right balance of the monsoon cycle. If the monsoon or if the rainy season is shorter or um, weaker than normally, then um, it generally could trigger a drought and crop failures. If the rainy season was longer or harder than it was normally, then um, flooding could occur and crops could just get washed out. So there was the, the, the monsoon element added kind of uh, made this a tricky um, balancing act that put the Indus civilization kind of on a knife's edge. Um, also, another, uh, again, be uh, benefit slash drawback was uh, the Indus civilization's natural barriers. Uh, the Indus was surrounded by mountains and deserts. So in a similar way to Egypt, this was both a blessing in the sense that um, it prevented attackers from getting to them or made it hard, made them made it less likely that they would be attacked. But this was also a drawback because um, they it, it made it harder for them to trade with people uh, outside of their civilization. Now fortunately the Indus and Ganges rivers helped overcome that and still allow them to trade, but the natural barriers would also serve as a barrier to trade as well as invasion. Moving on to the political structure, uh, we don't know a whole lot. Um, it looks like the Indus civilization was a theocracy, meaning that it was a government that was uh, controlled by a religion. And based on the uniformity between the cities and the high level of planning and sophistication in the uh, ruins of their cities, uh, it looks like the Indus civilization had a unified and strong central government. Since, uh, since a strong central government would be required in order to coordinate those efforts so effectively. 
based on the lack of weapons, archaeologists theorize that uh, the Indus civilization had, had little warfare, experienced little violent conflict, uh, simply because if they had experienced more, they would have found more weapons, or weapons would have been more predominant. Uh, looking at their society and culture, uh, the Indus religion was a form of polytheism, meaning they worshipped multiple gods. There's some evidence to indicate that uh, the polytheism of the Indus civilization may actually serve as the roots of early Hinduism, which is the dominant religion in India today. Um, and what is notable through uh, the artifacts recovered is that animals seem to have played an important part in Indus society, culture, and religion. What exactly their role was is unknown, but uh, the extensive incorporation of animal imagery indicates that animals were uh, pretty important. And lastly, looking at social classes, the Indus civilization is actually pretty unique among the early, the first four early river civilizations in that it didn't really look like they had um, really defined social classes. The social division seemed to be minimal. Um, the archaeologists mentioned that it didn't, the, based on the archaeological evidence, it didn't really look like there was a drastically different standard of living between uh, most of the population, which would indicate that there probably weren't that many social divisions in this society. And it looked like, by and large, most people um, had the capacity to have uh, consumer goods or non-essential goods, uh, things that would just make their lives easier as opposed to necessities. Which, again, places the Indus in a rather unique position as opposed to the other three. Okay, so moving on to China. Oh, hold on. There we go. So, uh, looking at ancient China. Uh, so China is actually the oldest civilization uh, that is still in existence. Modern Chinese civilization traces its roots back all the way back to ancient China. And a lot of cultural characteristics uh, that arose in ancient China still exist in modern Chinese culture and society today. So um, the physical geography of ancient China Ancient China was not did not control uh, the land all the land that modern China controls today. The ancient Chinese civilization was concentrated between the Yellow and the Yangtze rivers, uh, kind of in the eastern central part of the country. This region was known for having good farmland, but also was prone to dangerous flooding from the Yellow River. Again, that flooding is a benefit in the fact that it left a lot of really fertile silt. Uh, which made it good farmland, but also, um, again, it was dangerous and could uh, cause destruction. The other dominant feature or dominant geographical feature of ancient China was its isolation. Ancient China was uh, effectively isolated from the, from the rest of the world by natural barriers, notably mountains and deserts. Um, it was possible occasionally for people to get through um, but by and large, uh, they weren't attacked that often from outsiders, or rather they weren't invaded that often. And uh, there really wasn't that much trade going on, if at all. Ancient China actually didn't really trade with anybody. So again, this is a bet this isolation by through natural barriers was a benefit because it made it harder for people to get in to attack them, but it was a drawback because they couldn't trade with anybody to get things they couldn't make themselves. Everything they needed, they had to be able to get themselves or make themselves. They could not trade with other people. Looking at the ancient Chinese government, uh, ancient China was a monarchy that also practiced a uh, government structure, a political structure known as feudalism. Feudalism has existed for a while and uh, is probably better known for existing in Europe during the Middle Ages, but feudalism actually has its roots in ancient China. 
Basically, the way that feudalism worked was that, um, at least in this case, the emperor would uh, give nobles land, and in exchange, the nobles would give the emperor loyalty and govern that territory for him. The theory was that this was a more efficient way to ensure con greater control over larger amounts of territory by effectively setting up regional governors who were sworn to loyalty to the emperor. Um, this was actually a pretty inconsistent system. Um, in theory, the emperor had all the power, and as a monarchy would pass the throne down to uh, the oldest son. But um, in actuality, the power of the emperors varied. Um, as time went on and as the system of Chinese feudalism became more and more entrenched, as the noble governors of different regions got more comfortable and more established in their positions, um, they grew a lot more independent from the emperor. To the point where the emperor didn't really have a whole lot of power. The power actually resided within the nobles, um, simply because the emperor had no way to force the nobles to do what he wanted them to do. Um, the noble, but at a certain point, the nobles had gained the financial and military independence um, to allow them to basically operate independently from the emperor. Um, so this system, there are a couple notable aspects of, the Ch of Chinese feudalism uh, to pay attention to. So the first of these is what's called the Mandate of Heaven. So to justify their rule, Chinese emperors claimed that they had what was called the Mandate of Heaven. Basically what this was, their, their argument was that they were chosen by the gods or the universe to act as emperor. And that they were chosen because they would be good, just, effective rulers. However, it was not, like, just because you had the mandate of heaven at one point did not mean you would always have it. In order to maintain or keep the mandate of heaven, an emperor had to be a good leader. If the emperor was an ineffective leader, the belief was that he would lose the mandate of heaven and the gods would give it to another family. And then that family would be able to successfully uh, overthrow the previous dynasty and establish their own. Um, and again, the theory was that if that family didn't have the mandate of heaven, they wouldn't be able to successfully overthrow the rightful rulers of the country. So this concept was a, was a notable feature of Chinese feudalism in the sense that you have uh, the rulers of the country, you have the monarchs attempting to justify their authority or their rule over the country, and also seeking to use their uh, role or their um, possession of the mandate of heaven as a way to try and gain greater control or legitimacy over the nobility. However, the mandate of heaven didn't really necessarily do that in practice, as the nobility could just argue that if we overthrew them, then that means we have the mandate of heaven. Um, this is also a, a notable um, precursor or early form of what's referred to as divine right theory when it comes to Europe. And that's something we'll see when we look at European feudalism, how uh, the kings in Europe had a similar idea by arguing, uh, by arguing that they were the king because they were chosen by God. So it's kind of interesting to see how a similar concept like the mandate of heaven existed uh, millennia earlier. The other important no part to note about Chinese politics is what's referred to as the period of warring states. So as this system of feudalism developed, as the nobility got more and more power, and the emperors got less power, uh, the nobility effectively started to fight with each other for control. Um, so effectively, the period of the Warring States refers to a period where you have different groups of nobles fighting each other to try and take over their rival's territory, while also trying to overthrow the emperor and establish their own dynasty. 
So basically, the period of the Warring States was a lengthy period of civil war in ancient China that was only ended uh, when the Qin dynasty uh, successfully conquered the rest of China and united China under uh, a single ruler and re basically reestablished a strong monarchy in China. Moving on to Chinese culture, uh, looking at Chinese religion, uh, the Chinese religion is and was pretty interesting. It was kind of a fusion of polytheism, a, a belief in worship in many gods or multiple gods, and what we call animism, uh, an, a look, a, a, an emphasis or a respect for nature and uh, a worship of spirits. Uh, the animism component comes in in the form of ancestor worship, where um, the ancient Chinese, I think to a certain extent the modern Chinese, uh, placed a heavy degree of reverence had a, or had a high degree of respect and reverence for the spirits of their ancestors to the point where they would worship for, worship to, or worship and pray to uh, the spirits of their ancestors, hoping that their ancestors could intervene with the gods on their behalf to bring them good fortune or at least prevent uh, bad fortune from happening to them. Within Chinese culture as well, and this still exists today, there is a heavy emphasis on the family and the group in general. Um, Chinese culture differs drastically from Western culture or American culture, and, a main, and uh, the emphasis on the group over the individual. Here in the U.S., we generally place a higher value on individual rights and the good of the individual over uh, the good of the group. Uh, Chinese culture, dating back to its very start, has generally placed a higher value on the good of the group over the good of the individual. And in particular, the main group, the main focus in, the Ch in Chinese culture is and was the family. Basically, uh, a way to think about that is that the best action to take is not an action that would benefit you, but rather the action that would bring about the greatest benefit for your family, even if it means that you yourself might not benefit from it. Um, within the family, the family operated as a patriarchy, where the father was the head of the family and made all the, the important decisions. Um, and uh, wives would uh, defer to their husbands, and when their sons came of age, their older sons, uh, on matters as well. This notion of the family is also important because culturally, it's been brought in out, it was brought in out to kind of act as a framework for how the ancient Chinese viewed China as a whole. Uh, the ancient Chinese viewed, the, viewed China as effectively one giant family where the emperor was the father. So in that framework, with that mindset, um, the, the, the good of the country was placed at a very high, uh, was placed in very high esteem over the good of the individual. And, uh, the, again, as the emperor's rule was partially justified through this perspective as the emperor as, or through this perspective of the emperor as the father or the figurative or symbolic father of all China. So those are some notable concepts to pay attention to from Chinese culture. Looking at Chinese social classes, um, in the ancient period, uh, China had the traditional feudal social classes, uh, the upper class of nobles who owned the land, and the lower class of peasants who worked the land. Basically, the way that feudalism works, if we're going to try and take all of society into account, uh, you have the emperor giving the nobles land in exchange for their loyalty, and the nobles... Uh, or, or, or and the peasants worked the nobles' land in exchange for uh, protection and the right to live on the nobles' land, uh, and basically that was how uh, Chinese social classes operated. The noble, the nobles owned the land, and the peasants worked the land. 
And it's a pretty it's pretty similar to the way feudalism operated in medieval Europe, which we'll look at next quarter. So um, that's my breakdown of the Indus civilization in ancient China. Again, if you're still murky about stuff, if you have questions about stuff, let me know. We'll t I will do my best to address them uh, either through like a Canvas post or through email or through another video. Uh, hope you guys are doing well and I will uh, see you later.